We do have our first responders uh, Sunday coming up. That's going to be on September the 11th, uh, the anniversary actually of 9-11. Uh, we're going to have hundreds of uh, people that we've invited to come out. If you know a first responder, uh, please let them know about that. Invite them out. Uh, now, there is a different service on that day. Uh, we're going to have Sunday school at 9-15. And then the uh, only service we'll have that day is at 10-30. So don't forget about that. Uh, but if you know a first responder, you can invite out. It's going to be a great opportunity for us to have people come and really to minister uh, to those people. Also, we're going to be starting our uh, classes, our split classes on Wednesday. Uh, that's going to be starting in uh, two weeks on Wednesday. Uh, so be, if you could, please make sure you come out for those. A lot of great ones going on. Uh, Pastor Mark will be preaching one, uh, uh, Be Ready, Part 2. Uh, really, your ability to defend your faith. Uh, what does the Bible say about what we believe? How do we defend our faith with people? I'll be uh, teaching a uh, Wednesday night class called Dual Citizenship, uh, Being Christian in an Unchristian World. Uh, how do we live in the society that we're in? What does God expect from us? Uh, Pastor Smith is uh, teaching a class on what do you mean you're saved? Really covering the Bible doctrine of salvation. Uh, what does the Bible have to say about how a person becomes a Christian? What, is those, what, is, what does that mean? And then Tammy Smith is going to be doing a ladies class experiencing God's grace. Uh, so I challenge you, there are four great classes. Again, that's going to be this Wednesday, uh, but the following Wednesday, the room assignments will be set up for you. Also, there is a uh, connection card in front of you. I just met a brand new couple out in the lobby. You've only been here a couple of times and just really challenge them. And if you're visiting with us, uh, to fill out a uh, connection card. This simply gives us a record of your visit, allows us to kind of put a name and a face together. We'll also send you a letter out. Just thank you for coming, for being a part of our church. And then also, if there's anything we can do for you, every week I get a list uh, from our secretaries of here's things that need prayed about. And so if you write it on there, it gives us the opportunity to know the struggles you have, uh, things we can praise the Lord about for you, maybe some prayer requests you have. So please make sure before the offering plate comes around, take that connection card, get that filled out, and then get that into us. Uh, so again, it just gives us a knowledge and an ability uh, to pray for you. Uh, let's go ahead. We're going to start the word, uh, the, uh, the service with a word of prayer, and then we'll continue on. Father, we just thank you for this time we come, and Lord, we thank you for this place that you've established. And Lord, I pray today. 
Oh, Lord, that you'll bless all that happens. I pray that you'll take the music. Lord, I pray that you'll take your word. I pray you'll help it to minister to us. And Lord, as we come, I pray that we'll leave this place prepared to go and to serve the world in which you put us in. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to be here, for this place that you've established. And help us, Lord, to see your hand in our lives and all that happens. Now we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? And let's sing the banner of the cross. There's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of the King. As an ensign there we lifted up today, while as ransomed ones we sing. Marching on, marching on, for Christ counts everything but loss. And to crown him king, toil and 
set my soul on fire, Lord, for thy holy word. Burn it deep within me, let your voice be heard. Millions grope in darkness in this day and hour. I will be singing this morning. I don't say that to be trite, but I'm up here at the front and I can hear you. You all are singing very, very well. If you have your Bibles, go to Matthew 22 this morning. I did want to take a moment and just introduce myself. Most of you in the room, I think, would know uh, myself, my wife, maybe even my son. But in case you don't, we'll get to know each other right now for, for just a minute. Uh, my name is Mark Likens. Uh, people call me Mark. Sometimes they call me Pastor Mark. Uh, my wife is Maggie. She's a five foot four brunette, and I have a son who's two years old. A little cotton top that runs around here. He thinks that he owns the church and uh, runs in and out of everywhere. And I lose him in the hallways all the time. And then as of Thursday morning at 9:59 a.m., I'm a father to a little baby girl as well. Willow Grace is her name, and she was born extra healthy, nine pounds four ounces. She was a Big girl. So uh, she's in your bulletin today, actually, as one of the special deliveries or angel announcements or whatever we call that. And also in the bulletin is a special delivery and angel announcement for Micah and Janelle Grafton. We mentioned them last week. Uh, Janelle was pregnant with twins, and she was about 24 weeks and went into labor. Her water broke on Saturday. And uh, Sunday, we prayed, Lord, just help this to stop. Help, help those babies to stay in the womb for a couple extra weeks and, and just to have as much time in there as possible. And the Lord did not see fit to answer that prayer. She went back into labor Monday and delivered the boys who are doing well considering the situation. 
Uh, there's still a long road ahead of them and a lot of prayer uh, to go into. Those boys, Joel and Jesse, are their names. But Janelle's doing well. She's been discharged uh, from the hospital. And, uh, and pray for those boys. I told Micah we were able to go up Monday and see them that I think an angel mixed up our prayers or something, that we were, my wife was due last Sunday, and we were praying, Lord, give us the baby, give us the baby, help this to be over with, <laughs> give us the baby. And we were praying for Mike and Janelle, don't give them the babies yet, don't give them the babies yet, and it kind of reversed. So <clears throat> if, in case, angel, or prayer doesn't actually work that way, just so you know, <laughs> angels don't like deliver papers to, to God and such. I say that, I say that in jest. But uh, pray for the boys, sincerely do. They've accomplished Really, several hurdles. There's been more positive news than negative news. Tomorrow's a big day. They have a CT scan on the brains to try to ensure that there's not bleeding. So that's a big prayer request. That'll be a big hurdle for them to, to tackle tomorrow. So uh, pray for those boys, Joel and Jesse, if you think about it throughout the week. Matthew 22 is where we're at. I'm going to start in verse 34, and we're going to read down to verse 40. Matthew 22 and verse 34, a pretty famous passage of Scripture. Verse 34 says this, But when the Pharisees had heard that he, being Jesus, had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Father, thank you for today. I thank you that we can come to church, that we can open your word. I praise you that we can uh, give and worship in that way, that we can enjoy some singing, that we can praise you. Lord, I thank you for the truth that's found here in Matthew and really all throughout the Bible to love you and to love our neighbors. I pray this morning as we try to unpack this concept of loving our neighbors that you would speak to us, that you would work, that you would help, and that you would do a work in our hearts. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Israel's deliverer, divider of the sea, the conqueror of Jericho, Jehovah set them free. Some think of these as fables with no relevance today, but God's past power never passed away. stranded souls in darkness who long to see the light for those who tread a troubled road and feel they can't go on there's a promise we can stand upon the great I am lose it all and still be blessed. As a great I am still is. I'm a sinner saved by grace because. The great I am still is. 
Yes, I'm not today what I once was. And the great I am still is. And the great I am still is. The heavens and the earth are His. He's the merciful Almighty forever holy in everything. Amen. Thank you, Condits. If, if this family is not proof that musical ability is somehow inherently genetic, I don't know what is. I don't know if the Human Genome Project has discovered that inside of the genes yet, but thank you, Condits. They have more uh, musical ability in their, in their pinky finger than I have in my whole body. So thank you for putting to use for the Lord. Um, the command to love your neighbor is a unique command inside of Scripture. And this is for several reasons, but primarily this command is unique because the Bible explains it and references it often and gives us the context of what love your neighbor actually means. There are many commands in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, that are listed, but you don't see them referenced or explained beyond just the command itself. To pull kind of an obscure one as an illustration, there's a command in the Old Testament not to seethe the kid in the mother's milk, basically saying, don't cook the goat inside of its mother's milk. Now, I'm sure that there are some dietary reasons for what that would mean, but you don't see that command brought up again. You don't see Paul writing in the Gospels referencing, don't, you know, cook the, the goat in the mother's milk. The Jews did, they kind of extrapolated that and began to say, well, here's kind of what we think that means, and they would, they would not mix meat and dairy. So, if you were a Jew, then you can't have cheeseburgers, which is a very sad, sad thought. And they, they even began to extrapolate it further, and eventually they had kitchens for, uh, kitchens for the dairy and kitchens for the meat where we'd keep the utensils separate. And they went on and on and on. But it probably would have been helpful for them if they would have had a Paul or Luke or John weigh in and say, yeah, here's kind of what that really means. And when you come to the command to love your neighbor, you do get that. You get more than half a dozen times inside of the New Testament, Jesus and Paul and Mark and Matthew and Luke, all and even James weighing in on, here's what this means. Here's, here's what this looks like. When we talk about the command to love your neighbor, here is kind of some context for it. And today, we're going we're gonna to launch from Matthew 22, but my goal today is to kind of lasso in all of these different passages that talk about loving your neighbor and boil them down to here is what this means. Here is how this practically works itself out in our hearts and in our lives. We've been referring to today's uh, event, I guess you could call it, in today's sermon for several weeks now, uh, telling you we're going to have a You've Been Loved campaign and just kind of prep your minds. You're going to come. You're going to get some homework. And we've been building some anticipation for this day. And many of you have wondered, what exactly does this mean? If I was to put today in a nutshell, here is the nutshell I would give. There are several things that we want you to know, and there are, se there are several things, primarily one, that we want you to do. So here's what we want you to know. We want you to know, eliminate the bias, focus on the love, follow the thread. You say, what does that mean? You'll have to wait to find out. We'll talk about it in a moment. Then to do, we want to do random acts of love in our community and in our valley over the next seven days. So before I get too far ahead of myself, let's jump back to Matthew 22 and kind of launch from this passage. We find in Matthew 22 that up until this point, Jesus has answered a barrage of questions from the Herodians, from the Sadducees, from the Pharisees. And the Pharisees kind of take a step back and they have this team huddle and they're trying to stump Jesus. 
They're trying to give him a question and kind of volley up to him a question that he doesn't know the answer to, hoping that he'll strike out. So they have this team meeting, and whether they elected this lawyer or whether the lawyer just kind of took it upon himself to have this one last hurrah to trick Jesus, this lawyer steps up to the plate. And when we say lawyer, we don't mean he was a lawyer in the modern context, like he studied the American Constitution and he litigated before a judge. If, in case you're wondering, the American Constitution actually hadn't been written at this point. That was, that was you know, almost 2,000 years to come. So that's, it's not a modern lawyer. He, this lawyer is an expert in the Jewish law. He's an expert in the Old Testament. He knows, he knows all about the Torah. He knows about the commands. He knows love your neighbor. He knows love the Lord thy God with all your heart. This man is an expert. Probably he's a Pharisee. Probably this man has already memorized the first five books of the Bible, if not more. I don't know if you've ever tried to memorize a passage of Scripture. I've memorized a lot of verses. I've even memorized a couple chapters. But I've never memorized a book of the Bible. I should probably pick the shortest one and just memorize it to kind of say, you know, look at me, I memorized a book. But I've never memorized a book. I would challenge you to try to do that sometime. This man probably has all of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, committed to memory. So when he is asking Jesus, what's the first and the greatest commandment, he's not actually looking for an answer. He's not actually asking him something that he doesn't already know the answer to. He's more than likely hoping that Jesus is going to give him an answer other than the, the Shema, which is what Jesus is going to give him. He's probably hoping for something else so that he can look and say, oh, no, 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 you're wrong, and argue with him. So he asks Jesus, he says, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says in verse 37, Jesus says unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And every Jew knew this was the first and great commandment. Uh, they call it the Shema because the Shema starts with the word hear, which is the Hebrew word Shema, meaning hear. And the command in Deuteronomy 6 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And every Jew knew this. If you didn't know the entire Old Testament, every Jew knew this. This was the first command that a child would be taught. Every Jew knew this command. It was central to them. And then Deuteronomy 6 tells them that you should take that command and you should bind it upon your, uh, upon your hands. You should have it as a frontlet between your eyes and you should put it on the post of your gate and of your door. Now, they took that to be very, very literal. And more than likely, this man has bound on his, on his forearm a leather or cloth, something written, the Hebrew text, what Jesus just told him. This man has the Shema. He has love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. Probably when he asked Jesus the question, bound on his arm. He probably has right in between his forehead. They would take a, a little box and they would mount it to a kind of head strap or a headband and they would write this command on a scroll and put it in that box and they would wear it almost like a miner's light. If you've ever worn, maybe you're going into a cave and you put the little headband on, it has the light right there so that you can have your hands free. Similar to that. This man is asking Jesus this question, and the answer to the question is probably on his arm and in the middle of his forehead. But he, but he volleys up this question to him, and Jesus gives him the answer that he knew. But then he adds this. He adds, not just love the Lord your God, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, which is a bit more of an obscure command in the Old Testament. That was not part of the Shema. That was just in Leviticus, and you don't see that referenced as often. And Jesus tacks that on, and Jesus says, on these two laws, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and love your neighbor as yourself, hang everything else, that all of the other commands, all of the other laws flow out of these two. These two are of utmost importance. So when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, what does he mean? Well, how, do, how does that look practically? What does that mean for us as, as modern American Christians? What does that mean to love your neighbor as yourself? There are three things that I think that this means as we kind of take a survey of what the Bible says about loving your neighbor. And the first is this. In order to love your neighbor, we must eliminate the bias. Eliminate the bias. James says in James 2, verses 8 and 9, he says, if ye fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures. So James says, here's the royal law according to the scripture. The royal law is, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He says, if you do that, you do well. But if ye have respect as unto persons, ye commit sin 
and you're convinced of the law as transgressors. James is addressing a problem in the early church where the rich people in the church would kind of thumb their nose at the poor people in the church, and they would not fellowship with them. They would think less of them. They had an inherent bias towards those of a, of a different economic status. You see this addressed often. Paul, he beats this drum time and time and time again as he, as he writes different epistles, and he talks often about the Jew and Gentile bias, that the Jews have a bias towards the Gentiles because they're of a different ethnicity. They have a different bro- bloodline. They have a bias because they're of a different uh, religious sect, and the, and, the, and the Jews have this bias built into them, and James is addressing this bias, and he's saying, don't tell Tell me you love your neighbor and then thumb your nose at somebody that's worse off than you economically. Don't tell me you love your neighbor and then think less of somebody or treat somebody different because of their ethnicity or because of their gender or because of their religious background or because of how old they are, how poor they are, how healthy they are. He says it doesn't matter what it is that true love your neighbor, loving your neighbor as yourself has this context baked into it that you eliminate all of the bias, that there, there is no one that you don't love. And that is, that's rooted in the fact that Jesus loves everyone, that Jesus died for everyone, Jesus loves everyone. So as little Christians, as little Christ, we are supposed to love everyone as well. There, there is no person in, on the planet, I don't care where you look, what they look like, what they say, what they act like, what they dress like, what they smell like, it doesn't matter. There is no person that Christ does not love, therefore we should love them as well. And James says, if you are not doing that, then you're sinning. He, he calls them to the carpet on it. He says, you are, it's, it's not just, oh, you should do that, it's you're wrong. You are sinning, you are transgressing the law, you are failing to keep the law because you're not loving them and you're not eliminate, eliminating the bias. True love does not compare and contrast different people. True love sees everyone through the same filter. Christ died for them. Christ loves them, so I will love them as well. And if, if every person is worthy of Christ's shed blood, then tell me, by what criteria should they be excluded from our love? There is none. If, if Jesus was willing to love them and Jesus was willing to be extravagant with his love, then so should we. And I understand, I really, really do understand that your coworker sometimes is hard to love. I get that. I've had hard to love coworkers. I get that there's this unsavory neighborhood kid that you don't necessarily want to be around your kids and influence them in the wrong way. I get that sometimes it's a little tougher to relate with somebody because you don't have the same uh, social background or, or the same cultural background as them. I get that sometimes you see the homeless man and you want to be on the other side of the street so that you don't have to walk by him and you don't have to talk to him. I, I get that. It's built into us. We have these feelings. We have these inclinations. But that doesn't change the point that we are to love them. That doesn't change the point that it is our duty as Christians to share Christ's love to them and to their hearts. And you don't have to change them. You don't have to smooth out their rough edges. You don't even have to, st- to understand them. But you are supposed to love them. If Christ died for them, if he gave his life for them, then I dare say that they are worthy of our love, and who are we to think that we're a better judge of who gets love or not? If Jesus said everybody gets it, then we should share it as well. In true love, loving your neighbor as yourself is going to eliminate bias to such a degree that it is non-existent. It's just not there. It's not even how you think. It's not even how you process information. It doesn't matter to you what they look like or what they act like or what they wear or, or if they go to your church or not. Really, if, if, if you're sitting under the sound of my voice and you have some sort of bias and it's your, it's your default mode to judge, to profile, to bias based off of ethnicity or religion or economic status or gender or whatever else you want to fill in the blank, I would give you one word, stop. Like, literally, just stop. And if you need to ask for God's help with that, then okay, ask for his help with that, but stop. That's not okay. That is, that is the complete antithesis of loving your neighbor. It's the opposite. 
It's the opposite of showing love to people is to somehow bias or think less of them and not see them the way that Christ does. And we should see everybody under the umbrella of Christ loved them. They need the gospel. And I want to love them and I want to give them the gospel as well. But true love, loving your neighbor, it's not just eliminating the bias. It's also focusing on the love. Romans 13, Paul writes this in verse 9. And he says, for this... Thou shalt not commit adultery. And he begins to list off. He's going to list half of the Ten Commandments, the, the big ten. He's going to list half of them. He says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandments, he says, I'll give you these five, but any other commandment as well, it's briefly comprehended in this saying. And here's the saying. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then he says, love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Paul says, look, this one command to love your neighbor as yourself, that's worth just as much as half the Ten Commandments. That is, if you will focus, Paul is saying, if you will focus on love, you're not going to have to worry about covet. You're not going to have to worry about steal. You're not going to have to worry about murder. Because you're so focused on love, naturally the outflowing of love is that I'm not going to want to steal from them. I want to love them. I'm not going to want to covet what they have. I want to love them. I'm thankful that they have what they have. I'm not going to murder them or kill them because I love them. And Paul says if you would focus on that, just focus on the command to love, really the stars will kind of align and all the chips will fall into place and you'll have what you need. You just need to focus on loving your neighbor as yourself. He says something very, very similar in Galatians, probably even more pronounced. Galatians 5, he says, for all of the law, all of it, is fulfilled in this one word, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He says you can boil it all down to this one command to love your neighbor as yourself. And we said that, that this week we're going to make this about uh, having random acts of love, and we're going to give you a homework assignment of sorts. You probably saw when you came in the, in the doors, there's a table there and there's some cards. I don't know how many cards the early service took. I hope they left some cards for you. So, but there should be some cards there. If you got a bulletin today, there's an insert, and the insert has ideas on how you could show love to people. And they're just that. They're ideas. There's the top ten easiest ideas. There's ideas for kids. There's ideas for families. There's ideas for adults. And it's anything from giving a, a bottle of water to your mailman all the way to getting some extravagant dinner and gifts and taking that to the children at the children's hospital or anything in between. So we, we are giving you this today and we're saying let's do some action, let's be intentional about this, let's have a homework assignment, but if our focus after today's sermon and after today is to just go do stuff, if our focus is on action rather than love, we've missed the point. The point is not just to do stuff. Anybody can be philanthropic. Anybody can donate. Anybody can, can help or, or lend a hand to somebody when they're broke down on the side of the road. But it's entirely different if you're loving them because Christ loved them and, you're, and your action is flowing out of that love. Because here's the truth. This week we could give without loving. We could, there were, there were 2,500 uh, little business cards. 2,500. And if all of those get taken, and all of those get passed out, and we do, we leave $5 at the ATM for the person behind us just to have a random $5, you know, $5 more in your pocket, and we put a little love card with it, and they take it and get it. And we, and we pay for the person behind us at the drive-thru, and we, and we leave the drive-thru tenant with a love card and say, give this to the car behind me. If we do all of that, and we do 2,500 uh, random acts of love this week in our valley, I think that will make an impact. I think that will be good. But if our focus is just, oh, we have a, we have a quota, we have to get 2,500 random acts of love in, that's, that's our goal, that's our homework assignment, let me just check it off, then we've missed the point of today. The point of today is not do, the point is love, because you can give without loving but you cannot love without giving. When you're focused on love, the natural outflow of love is I'm going to give. I'm going to help. I'm going to want the best for that person. My daughter was just born, I mentioned this earlier, a Thursday. And it's, those of you that are parents, you know, it is just so amazing and pronounced how much love you just instantaneously have. And I already have an inherent danger as, as a modern American who's spoiled to death to spoil my daughter because I want to give to her because I already love her even though she's just a couple days old. But when we really love, 
Giving is natural. Giving is easy. Giving is not a checklist. Giving is not something that we're just doing this week for the next seven days on we're going to love the valley week. It's something that will happen in September and in October and in Thanksgiving. You may give some family that doesn't have very much. You may go give them your Thanksgiving meal or invite them over to your house. You may decide with your kids that, you know what, we're not going to have a big Christmas this year. We're going to spoil somebody else, and we're going to love someone that doesn't have very much. This will begin to work itself out naturally in your life, and you don't need a business card or a little list inside of your bulletin to do that. And I'm thankful for the cards. I'm thankful for the list. But when you love... Giving and action takes place naturally. David Livingston, English missionary to Africa, said, sympathy is no substitute for action. And I agree with David Livingston, but I would say this. Love is. Love's a substitute for action. As a matter of fact, love eats action's lunch all day long. Because when you love, action is baked into it. You're not just acting. There's more to it than that. And, and today, if we walk out of here thinking, I need to go do, we've missed it. We need to go love. We need to love him first, and that will produce love inside of our hearts that we should spread to other people. Love is where it's at. That's the focus of today. It's to wrap our arms and wrap our minds around this idea of let's love people. Let's eliminate the bias, yes, but let's focus on the love, yes. And then I would say this lastly, we need to follow the thread. You say, what does that mean? There was a fairy tale written in the 1800s by George McDonald's uh, called The Princess and the Goblins. And it's actually, I wouldn't recommend you read it to your kids, number one, because it's 161 pages, and number two, because it's actually a little frightening. But, uh, but he, was a, he was an author, and he was also a Christian minister, and the point of the fairy tale was to be a bit of a metaphor about the Christian life. And he tells the story of this little princess who lives in a very, very big house, and she often wanders around and finds her way around the house, but there are goblins and gremlins that live in the mountains that want to get her, and they scare her. So she's wandering around her house one day, and she somehow finds her way up into the uttermost room of the house, the attic, and there lives her fairy grandmother. And this, this woman is, she is beautiful and powerful and just a sight to behold, and she feels so safe in her presence. She, she tells her fairy grandmother, when I go to sleep, I get scared, and the, and the goblins try to come in my room. If only I could be around you, then I, I would feel safe if I could be around you. So the grandmother says, I'm going to do this for you, princess. She takes off a ring, and she ties a thread to the ring, and she puts the, the ball of string in her drawer and puts the ring on the little princess's finger and says, go back to your room and go to bed. And if, if you get scared, if the goblins come, if the gremlins come, Take the ring off, put it under your pillow, pull the thread tight, put your index finger on it, and it will lead you back to me. She says, but know that it may take you to me in a roundabout way. It's not always going to take you straight to me. So sure enough, the little princess goes to sleep that night, and a goblin or a gremlin gets in her room, and she can hear the snarling and the hissing, and she's scared, and she, she wakes up, she takes the ring off, she puts it under the pillow, she pulls it tight, she puts her finger on it, and sure enough, it begins to just kind of lead her out of the room to her, to her delight. But when she gets to the hallway, it doesn't, it doesn't turn up the stairs, it turns down the stairs to her dismay. And it leads her to the door, and then it leads her to her shock and horror out into the dark night. And then it leads her into the mountain where the goblins and the gremlins live. And then there's a whole series of events. She goes into a cave in the mountain and into a little hole in the mountain. And all these events happen. And eventually the thread leads to this pile of rocks in the middle of this cave that there's no way to get through them. And she, she thinks to herself, I know what I can do. I can just, I can follow the thread back. It'll get me back home. And she turns and the thread has, it's vanished. It only leads forward. And she in the story, she falls on the rocks. It's kind of sad, actually. She falls on the rocks and begins to cry and to wail. And she comes to her senses and thinks, I just need to start clearing these rocks one by one. And as she does, she finds that on the other side of the rock, she begins to hear a voice. And there's a little boy named Cordy who's stuck behind the rocks. And she gets Cordy and she tells him, we're going to go see my grandmother. I know it. I've just been telling myself, follow the thread, follow the thread. It's going to go to grandmother. It's going to go to grandmother. It's going to be okay. And she gets Cordy, and Cordy can't see the thread. He thinks it's imaginary, but he decides to go along nonetheless. And eventually it leads them all the way back to the fairy grandmother where it's happy and it's peaceful and it's blissful, and they all escaped. 
Now, if I was to give a very secular illustration about what it means to love your neighbor, I would dare say it's the princess and the goblins and the fall of the thread. We must understand that as we act, as we serve, as we love, that we are following the thread of love that is always going to lead us back to Jesus. Jesus says that we love because he first loved us. That our, our plumb line, and, and Jesus was great in Matthew to give us this guide, this guidepost, this marker of love God with all your heart and love your neighbor. That's what everything else ha- hangs on. That's the threat. That's what you need to follow. That's what you need to focus on. And it always leads back to him. But sometimes, many times even, it's going to lead you in a roundabout way. You're going to start to love your neighbor and you're going to find yourself in a soup kitchen serving food to someone that you never thought you were going to be there. You're going to focus on loving God with all your heart and loving your neighbors yourself. And you know what? You may find yourself in a refugee camp somewhere in the Middle East ministering to Muslims that are refugees from Syria who are fleeing for their lives because their family is being murdered. You're going to find that when you follow the thread of love, that it's going to take you places that you never imagined would happen. And sometimes they're scary. Sometimes, sometimes they take us back a bit. It may be that you, you love that coworker who's impossible and they don't love you back. They become more impossible. You could have that family member that hates religion and hates church and hates Bible and don't talk to me about that and you begin to love them with Christ-like love and they become more turned off and, and they become more angry and more difficult to deal with because of that. It's not always the case that when we that when we follow the thread of love and we love our neighbors, that it's going to produce this bed of roses in our life. But I can tell you this, it is always going to lead you back to Jesus, and oftentimes it will cross your path with somebody that needs Jesus as well. There is, the, the point of loving your neighbor is not about you. It's about him. It's about that he loved us when we were unlovable, when we were difficult to deal with, when we were, were nasty and angry and we were against him, that Jesus loved us. And loving your neighbor is about loving him because he first loved us. And if we think for one second that this week is about, oh, this is a great idea, love the, love, loving our neighbor week, you've been loved week, we're going to trick people into coming into church. I I see what you're doing, Harvest. We're going we're gonna to backdoor this thing. We're going to surprise them, and we're going to give them a, a random act of love, and that's just going to take them back, and then they'll be really drawn to Jesus, and then they'll really come. That's not the point at all. The point is for you to focus on love and to focus on Jesus Christ and for it to accomplish something in your heart. If this accomplishes nothing in the valley, if no one sends us an email and says thank you, if no one stops you and says you made my day, I was having a tough day, and thank you, that's just what I needed, if none of that happens, it's still worth it if it accomplishes our hearts being drawn to Jesus because of it. That is what loving your neighbor is really about. We look at a God who loved us with a scandalous love, and in turn, that provokes us to love other people because he loved us. Not just because it's a command and it's, you must do this. It's because his love has been shed abroad in our heart, and we just can't help but to share that with somebody. Romans 8, I love this passage of Scripture, says, I'm persuaded, so I'm fully convinced, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That as Christians, we cannot be separated from, from God's love. There is, there is no, I'm going to keep you at arm's length, child. There is no, I, you know what, you're going to have to earn my love a little bit. Nothing can separate us. And we should be so joined to love, that it should be part of our Christian DNA. It should be part of who we are and what we do, that we know God loves me, I can't be separated from it, and I'm going to love other people because of that. I want them to experience what true love is all about. And true love is only produced in a spiritual way. It is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Love is one of those fruits that can only truly be embraced when it is in a spiritual way from the Spirit of God in light of what Jesus has done in our hearts and lives. 
So what does, what does love your neighbor really mean? First, it means we eliminate the bias. There is no filter on who we love and who we do not love. There, there, is, there is no criteria that we judge people by and we, and we exclude them and we look at them and, and we, we profile. There's, that's, that's trash. It eliminates all bias. But it also, you focus on the love. It's not about action because love produces action. It's not about doing, it's not about fulfilling the commandment. It's not about being good little boys or girls or good little Christians or good little church members. It's about focusing on love, that I want this to be accomplished in my heart. And it's also about tracing the thread. That understand that all of this leads to Jesus. He is our example. He loved us first. He loves us beyond what we could dare to dream. And it may not always be a bed of roses loving our, our neighbors, but it does always lead us to him and to other people that oftentimes need him. So when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, that was a startling command. And Jesus unpacks that in several other places. He says in Matthew 5, he, t he tells those that are gathered together, he says, look, you've heard that it had been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor. He says, you, you know that's been said. And you've heard that it had been said, thou shalt hate thine enemy. He says, I say unto you, love your neighbor, yes, but love them that hate you. Uh, bless them that persecute you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. And I just paraphrase that. But he said, look, it's, it's not just about loving your neighbor. And the crowds, a bit, they're a bit taken back. They said, what do, you, what do you mean love our enemies? What do you mean pray for those that use us and persecute us? And Jesus, Jesus says this to them. I want to read it to you. Uh, Jesus says to them, in, um, in Matthew uh, chapter 25. Forgive me, Matthew 5. Look at verse 43. Jesus says, you've heard that it has been said, love your neighbor and, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And then he says in verse 46, if they're, after they're a bit taken back, for if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? If ye salute your brethren only, what, what more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Jesus says, look, I'm going I'm to flip this on his head for a second. So you're telling me, you love the people that love you? Congratulations. You want a cookie? Like, what, what's the big deal? Anybody does that. The publicans do that. The tax collectors do that. That's, that's easy. If we all have people that are nice to us or give to us or they love us and we want to love them back, he says, that's no big deal. He says, but true love, loving your neighbor, it's not love your neighbor and hate your enemy. It's there is, there is no enemy. Everyone is my neighbor. This is what the account in Luke says. When, uh, when the person asks him, Jesus says, love your neighbors yourself. And they say, well, Jesus, who is, who is my neighbor? And Jesus gives the story of the good Samaritan. And he says, everybody is your neighbor. That this, this is not about we're going to be selective and have bias and we're going to choose and we're just going to try to love the people that love us. This is we're going to love everybody and do our best to show it to everyone because Christ loved us. And loving your neighbor, there, there are no exclusions. It's not, it is not literally, and I think we know this, it is not literally the person next door to me. It's not the person sitting in the pew next to you, although it is. It's everyone. It's, it is the person next door and the person in the pew and the person halfway around the world. It's loving everyone, eliminating our bias, focusing on the love, and following the thread and understanding this always leads back to Jesus. This always leads back to him. This is supposed to produce a work in my heart. This is supposed to do something to me. This is supposed to change me because of what he did for me. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word and for this so simple command, but oh so potent and oh so powerful. And Lord, I pray that we would wrap our heads around this concept of loving our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, I pray that we would be generous with our love today. I pray that we would do our best this week to focus on love 
and that, that would naturally work itself out in our lives and in the, in the lives of other people that we impact and that we try to show random acts of love to. Lord, I pray that you would uh, use this and help us to check ourselves and to say, is there any bias? Lord, I pray that if there is, that we would confess it, that we would forsake it, that we would be a family here that loves each other and loves everyone else. I pray that you would use this in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand with me in a spirit of prayer, I'm going to ask the pianist to pray. And if God has...